Uh, so she did her due diligence. She's been researching for over four years. The information that she has is pretty much indisputable. It's there for anyone to access. It's public information. And so this is a compilation of many years and hard hours of work for her. Um, so she brought it to the, the council. Um, and now she's taking the next logical step of attempting to present it at the state level. Um, so she came before the committee on August 1st. So she's been kind of planning this meeting since then. She did get some responses from the council members, and that's awesome. There may be other things that the council can do. Okay, so after pairing up Terry's PowerPoint, we're going to open it up for questions and answers regarding her PowerPoint information. Okay, like I said, uh, her information is pretty much indisputable, so we're not here to, um, you know, say that that's not happening or how do you know that. All that ground truthing has been done. So she's at a point where she's just needing help and moving on. So the questions um, I'm going to ask you to ask questions about the issues, even if there's no one in this room today to answer them. Because the questions, even the questions that go unanswered, are gonna be very important for her um, to take it to the next level, or to find more information that she may still be needing. So all questions and any answers are helpful. So if a question is posed, and if you feel like you represent the group or the agency who might have the answer to that, you can please feel free to answer. And even if you can't commit to your answer, if you are comfortable enough to share it, please do. Okay? So after that, uh, Terry's going to go over a few action items that she's identified through the Kilpaha Action Network. So they've identified some um, action steps that could be taken, maybe should be taken. And she's also identified maybe some of the entities, agencies, groups, individuals that may be able to help with those things that she's identified. So she'll go over that. And then you folks will have um, the opportunity to respond to the action items that she's identified. Because this is actually where she's asking for the help. So if you can help with any of those things, any of the issues that she's raising, um, any of the agencies that might be involved to help, and also any other stakeholders that might be important for this discussion. So we'll be asking for your help there. And then we'll all do a quick meeting wrap up of whatever was identified, anything that was committed to, we'll talk about. Um, next steps, and then Terry will wrap up with a closing remark. So, just to let you know, I don't expect for any dialogue while she's going through the PowerPoint. Okay? And when we have the question and answer the discussion um, sessions, it's not meant to be a discussion, okay? So just keep your questions brief and your answers even briefer, and we should be able to get through everything we need to in time. And of course, if we have any extra time, then we'll be able to talk story. Okay, if we have some time in here, I will give you folks a little bit of a break. <laughs> Um, to mill around, do what you need to do, maybe talk to each other. And um, if not, it's okay. We'll just talk. Okay, so that's um, my part, and I'm happy to introduce now Terry Nakiyahi. Aloha, thank you very much for coming to, uh, today. Terry Nakiyahi, um, resident of Kyokaha. Um, and just information about um, our issues in Kyokaha, uh, Hawaiian homes and uh, Hilo and Pana'ewa area. District 3, Precinct 2. I'm sorry, um, Terry. 
Go ahead. I'm going to interrupt right now. Go ahead. Introduce I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. We need to do a round table introduction. I'm so sorry. So um, we'll start with Monica. Aloha, my Kako. Uh, Monica Morris with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. I'm at the advocacy shop. My particular area is public policy. Um, Department of Hawaiian Homelands is one of my chief areas. I am proud to call Keokaha my um, homestead that I grew up in. So I'm from the Niloi Ohana. Genesis and Elizabeth were my uh, parents. And it was my pleasure to know Senator Kahele's father when he was a senator, Senator Gil Kahele. So mahalo everyone for being here today. I'm Harry Kim, I work here, and I'm proud to say I was a coach at Kyoka with the most awesome football team ever. <laughs> Aloha, Shannon Matson. Um, I'm the East Hawaii Vice Chair for the County Democratic Party. It's a mouthful. And um, yeah, and I live in Waikiki. Aloha, my name is Kama Hopkins. I am the aide to uh, Trustee Bobby Lindsay, the OHA Trustee to Hawaii. Hi, my name is Jared Kodani. I don't represent any particular organization, uh, but it's thanks to OHA that I'm actually able to be an external producer through Naleo, and they've been more than gracious to Naleo o Hawaii, which is the public broadcasting, I think, 52, 53, 54, through Spectrum, I think now. Um, but uh, they're gracious enough to allow us to use their video equipment. Please bear with me. I'm kind of in a our position with the camera because it's a um, there's a lot of people so but it, you can add, pretty much see what I'm I'm looking at on the view screen if it's pointed toward you so thank you very much. <coughs> sure, I'm well Bannister, as you know. Um, I head this office here and I manage East Hawaii. I service the points in Hamakua, Kilo, Pohoa, and Kabu. Um, yeah. Chris Todd, I'm the state representative for like, Central Hilo, which includes Keoha, downtown, and most of Waikea, the high high street. Kai Kahele, Senate District 1, all of Hilo, including Keoha. Uh, on behalf of Council Member uh, Susan Hilo, <laughs> um, she regrets being unable to attend, so uh, uh, we'll go off island for a funeral. Um, my name is Peter Sir, I'm her legislative assistant. Council District 3 represents Kiaka, Aneva, Benny Drive, Oki House Lots, Bakuka, Kiao Village. I'm Eileen O'Hara, and I serve District 4 on the Hawaii County Council. And District 4 is actually referred to as Lower Puna. Um, it doesn't encompass the area under discussion today, but I'm also chair of the Environmental Management Committee on the council. And uh, Terry and I met way back when I first got into office um, at the beginning of the year about this, the issues that she wants to bring forward here. And we worked to get her into a presentation on the committee, I think it was August, right? August 1st, um, which was very enlightening. Uh, for the public and for many members of the council, and I'm just um, really impressed with all the work that she's done. So I'm glad to be here today. Corey, oh, Corey Harden, on the board of Sierra Club um, for this item. I'm John Beard with the Department of Health, uh, Hazard Evaluation and Emergency Response Office. I'm a one, one person helo office. Mm -hmm been working here over 10 years now and had attended three or four meetings of uh, the uh, 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 Action Network meetings over the last year. I'm Bob Ernst and uh, Terry came to the Sierra Club meeting and asked us to attend. That's why we're here. I'm also with High Cop and that's another reason I'm here because we're working on the noise impact issues not only to Keokaha, to Panaeva, but to the entire Hawaii Island. Hello. Aloha, I'm Kuhan Pak. I'm with the Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action. We sponsor the Kuleana Academy, which is a candidate's training program. And after I met Terry and I saw all the work she's doing here in Keokaha Paneva, I said, please apply to be in our candidate's training program. And so she now is. Uh, Phil Kucharski, I'm director of DEM of Environmental Management. I work directly for a bank. <laughs> 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 
Yes. I'm sorry, you're, oh, and I'm sorry. You're being videotaped. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Kai, for, for meeting with us today. And he had asked and requested to have in the room people that I've been working with, or Hilkaha Action Network has been working with in the years. And we appreciate every one of you because you have made effort to attend many of our meetings. Kilkaha Action Network is actually a <coughs> committee, um, and I don't see Uncle Patrick, he might be coming in. He's, He's coming in the door right now. Right now. Perfect. Uh, Patrick Haubai Ola'a is the Kilkaha Association President. Um, in 2013, we discussed how I was going to be moving on with this, um, with the issues that I wanted to, to, to bring to the table. So this is, Kilkaha Action Network is actually a committee off of our community association. I separated meetings uh, with just CAN alone only because there are so many different, it's big, the issues are big, um, and, um, and this is where we started. So this is years of coming together. I started this program by finding an environmental justice management system um, to, to work with our community. So have been attending our meetings and letting our community know how, how I was been going to uh, move forward on um, the issues of generators, pollution, and its relationship to the health um, and safety of our people in, in Kilkaha and Tana Eva, and also Waiakea. And the reason why I chose this system and used, not used, but managed to have my community with this um, data finding process was it uh, because it was easier to quantify um, information with a group of people. So it happened to be uh, people from the Department of Hawaiian Homelands and Hawaiian Homes. So the the management system that I chose was called Brown Truthy. And what this project, how this works, well, I'm going to skip this, Kyoka Action Network, Pui Bay, big issue with our community. Um, everybody knows that Pui Bay is a jurisdiction of DHHL. Um, county parks are different places, you know, in Kyoka. But Pui Bay is Kyoka's jurisdiction. Um, on, um, Hawaiian homes. So, <coughs> ground truth. Uh, the ground truth method that I use is to. It was a process to have a CRA data collection, cumulative risk assessment. So, with this idea, it gives our community an idea as to how I was going to be moving forward in the community, which um, was categorized in three parts. And that would be human data that I would be collecting from our community. And um, <clears throat> data that came from the government and agencies, regulatory agencies. And also the idea of indicators of, um, uh, that would be put together on a map. <clears throat> so we were lucky in Kyokaha to have the offer of a student from the John Hopkins Medical School of Public Health to offer her assistance. And what she did after I identified some of these um, indicators of generators that I felt would be something that our community would have to look at, asking for a cumulative health study, um, mapping the neighborhood was important, and that was her expertise, which was awesome, because what she did was took the data that I had um, concerns about and identified them the generators of um, pollution or emissions that were there required to report to the Environmental Protection Agency. So her expertise was to gather spatial analyses from different agencies, data that was available publicly, and, and put them on the map for me, for our community. And part of the gathering of this data was particulate matter, if, if needs be. But the whole idea of this cumulative risk assessment was to see the excessive exposure that might be um, implemented or uh, might be, uh, I guess, exposed to our community. So four and a half years of data being put together, including water quality monitoring, 
was part of what we put together on the on a mapping system. So this, I don't know if you can see this very well, but it should be really quick. These are the identified generators that we are concerned about. Now, some of them are public utilities like sewage, um, also Department of uh, Transportation, Department of, um, well, the Harbor, Transportation Harbor and Airport. Um, <coughs> and waste uh, fuel burning facilities like the oh. the landfill, and military. So, um, these are the, the indicators of um, generators of pollution and emissions that our community has been concerned about. And how did I identify these? Was to do a survey that was sent out to our community. And there are several people that were able to participate. At least 50, a little over 50 surveys were submitted to our neighborhood. I went knocking door to door at, at community events and did a survey with this student so that the sampling uh, that she had done was done with uh, the eyes of someone else. So it, we can at least make it a credible gathering of information, uh, which, is, which she is not allowed to do with human data, human collection. So um, <clears throat> these were the identified facilities of concern in our community, which would be Kyokaha, Panaeva, and some of Waikia. Um, some of the people from Puna did want to participate as well, so I do have some surveys from Puna as well. Um, I don't have the facility uh, PGB here, but um, this is sort of what we're working on. So the student put together a mapping, and this is what she did, um, a little bright here, but identifying community. So Hawaiian Homes community is the community that I use to start the data collection. So the green that you see here is the identified Department of Hawaiian Homelands in Hilo. Um, the red dots that you see here, the bigger red dots, are the generators that are in between our community, both Panaeva and Hilo. And um, the other darker circles you see there are the public schools that are in between all the generators. So we were identifying public uh, schools, um, the community, and the generators within our community. So, Ray, yes. I know I'm not supposed to ask questions, but we cannot tell the difference between the violators and the school. Okay. So can you point yes. to where? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I only have a little thing here. But the bigger, these are all the identified, just some of them. And the reason why they're here is because they're currently not compliant to EPA standards. So um, with with the current information that we have here. So this would be some of the identified um, airport, well not airport, landfill. Um, the airport comes under a different um, regulatory agency. You know, so uh, EPA does not have the current data on their My Right to Know site. So we have here at Helco, and um, this is another facility here, and uh, <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> we also identified what was happening on the west side. So we have another map on the west side. And the reason for doing this is that you can see where Hawaiian holds the green and the, um, that little red dot, like the other side on the east side, is Helco on the west side. DOT airport right next door. So sort of kind of framing a pattern for some of these facilities and industry that is being put near Hawaiian homes. Um, and the, you know, in the future, we will be doing the same for all the other islands. So you can see where Hawaiian homes and, um, lands are and where some of these facilities are in, in the pattern. Okay, <coughs> airport, fumes. I live on the fence line. Um, we have families that in the early 60s who have had um, to bear an executive order uh, done by the federal government to move a large portion of our Hawaiian families to relocate them. Um, they condemned their land, executive order, 
and they had to move. And so they were moved on an air home. So our families, <coughs> my family lives in the front of the fence line. Gas storage companies, um, this is another issue in the front of our wide home lands. A few uh, walking steps away from the closest residents. Um, this is an Aloha Petroleum Federal Administrative Order. So some of these facilities have had the federal government um, come down and cite them for administrative order. And this administrative order that came from the federal government was for them to particularly fix some of the, the infractions that they had within, within our community. So this administrative order was done in 2014 and um, they were asked John Pierre will later on, if you have any questions, can give a little insight as to what that meant. <clears throat> Helco, this is an example of another generator, probably the worst that he, uh, of emissions because it burns fuel, uh, the sludge, receives this fuel from the pier to railroad. This is an example, if you went to my right to know site from the EPA, they have available up to date, maybe 2016, the last um, information you can pull together from them. This is how they put it where you can see. It's public information. You can go online and you can see around the world, punch in your address and poof, all of these companies that are, that are um, participating and giving their information to EPA annually <clears throat> this is what it looks like online. And they're usually very, very accurate about these um, reports. So this is helpful. And the red identifies a quarter um, of non-compliance to EPA standards. This is an example of what these generators have to comply to. And they all have different thresholds because they all emit different chemicals after operating to get their um, their facilities up and running. <coughs> Landfill um, was another um, EPA uh, company, or not company, utilities that have had to report to EPA. Uh, Department of Health was the um, overseer for regulations. And we uh, know that it's going to be closed. They did have a violation. Some of these violators um, have had to pay very big fines, $650,000, $350,000, um, and our question was, where does this money go? Does it actually come back to the community who has had to, uh, who, who has had to bear the excessive amount of exposure within the years cumulatively? Um, just to let you know, no, it does not come to our community goes back to the federal government. Wastewater, <coughs> um, and, you know, thank goodness uh, this administration finally fixed our, um, the repairs that needed to have been done uh, in front of Kuki Bay, where the outfall is. Um, Kuki Bay is right in front of Kyokaha. And the facility that you see here is where the pipes go out into the ocean, I think three quarters of a mile out of Kuhi Bay. This is an administrative order in 2014, Region 9 EPA that, um, over, that you know, was, I guess, implemented for Hilo wastewater treatment to fix and repair. They have another repair, uh, Mr. Kucharski can uh, give us an update as to um, whether they fixed or repaired what they have uh, by November 1st. <coughs> this is a copy of our system currently here in Hilo. You can, oh, I'm sorry, not this one. This is where the Hilo wastewater treatment is, which is on the opposite side of the runway. The runway is right here. This is the Hilo wastewater treatment. They used to do the raw sewage in front of our bay. They don't do that anymore. It's across on the other side of the runway. It goes through Kyokaha and out the same pipes. This is the repair. Uh, these are the outfalls on the island. But these are the repairs 
that have been done with the wastewater treatment. Um, thank you to Mr. Pacharski. This is an, uh, one slide that he had given me so that you can see how they repaired the pipes on the outside. Okay, so these are some of the um, concerns that we have. Hydrogen leaks in the sewage um, pipes, reports of illnesses after swimming in the Kilo waters, polar, coral diseases, depletion of marine life, ecosystems not balanced, outdated fatigue systems, and no emergency systems in place. <clears throat> Part of the data collection that I have received within the time in the five, in four and a half years, is at least 12 accounts of community members who, were, who has identified sicknesses after they swim in, the, in our shoreline. Um, they gave me the site that they were, uh, that the activity was done, the date, the time, what their symptoms were, what doctor they've seen, how they were treated, and the diagnosis. So I have on a chart um, people that are feeling more comfortable giving me this kind of information, which helps me find ways of identifying um, where people might be getting sick. And you know, you can later be able to find out where the source is, what is what is you know the reason for them getting staph and MRSA, which is the result the, the result of everyone that gave me their data. <clears throat> okay, um, we just got another student, uh, another student that is doing her graduate studies to start looking at all of these um, closures and sicknesses, and she is going to do the same like the other student, and that's mapping where these sites are on a GIS map for the University of Florida. The University of Hawaii did their own studies on staff and MRSA, and I saw her giving her presentation in front of the county council not too long ago. This is uh, a concern. Um, Governor Ike did pass a bill that cesspools uh, should be converted either to a system. Um, I can leave that to our county council to explain um, where you know an update on that or Mr. Kucharski. This is a, an example, another mapping. The dark little dots here are all the cesspools that we will eventually have to convert to a system. Our concern in our community was what will be happening when everybody does convert to the system? Is it going to compound the issues that we're concerned about now? Um, because it's all going up, booty bay. Another important important factor is the is disasters and hurricanes, you know, tsunamis, uh, county council, uh, the county evacuation plan, which I feel could be looked at, looked over, um, because they don't identify the concerns that our community is worried about, and that would be in case there is a tsunami and a hurricane like Harvey and like Katrina, all of these facilities that are near the harbor. Um, what would happen if we did have a disaster? Are we prepared for that? So these are some of the things that we've been working with um, with the local emergency planning committee. Several of us here are part of the uh, local emergency planning committee. Uh, Gerald Kosaki is the fire chief, battalion chief, who heads the LEPC and has been working with us and our issues and I really appreciate that because that gives us some dialogue about how we can work together in case there is an evacuation and an emergency. So one of the questions that were asked in our, com in our community was how prepared is our first responder team? Would they be able to identify the toxins and in case there's a leak, if there was anything to happen with this, the different uh, gas storage companies near the harbor, um, are they prepared to be trained to deal with things like that? And, and on the, in our LAPC, it is mentioned that you know they could use a lot more help when it comes to funding um, for training for hazmat and also to have it a prevention and preparedness um, situation as opposed to reactive. Um, Kyokaha 
concern for it being an environmental injustice as well as a social social injustice. So one of the things that we did identify was the disproportionate share of negative environmental consequences upon people. And um, I don't have to tell you, but the data that was collected should be able to tell you basically what do you think. So this map shows all the Hawaii homelands, where most of the facilities and industries and generators are, and that would be near our Hawaii home community. So what is a disproportionate burden? Expose a, a, a community that has had to bear the high risks of generators and pollutions and excessive exposure. This was a data put together, a census of Native Hawaiian population from a census um, report. And basically by the percentage of Hawaiians and where they're at placed on this map and where, the gener um, where these facilities are. Okay, so that was everything in a nutshell. <laughs> really quick. I did give um, some suggestions suggestions to the county council and I think after the county council um, presentation um, uh, there was a majority uh, response for council members I guess I say majority who were, who were there supporting the idea that something needs to be done um, and that supported Sue's office because she's working with us to see if we could come up with ideas and strategies for some of the concerns that was brought forward. And um, so later we'll ask Sue's office to see where um, an update and basically on that and see how it goes. But this is what we suggested. Every department in the state knows, you know, we don't need any more data. You know, I think what we have brought, you know, brought to the table is enough to know that we have problems. Um, every toxic facility in the homestead um, near the vicinity should have a current update on evacuation plans, hazard plans, community insurance. Do these facility, uh, facilities have this kind of um, uh, documents for our first responders? That was important. Because I work on the, with the local emergency planning committee, and you get to work with civil events, you get to work with um, fire, DOH, hazard, and information that is important. They only, uh, the civil defense only has PGB's evacuation plan in their office. And one of the um, requests that we're asking these facilities uh, is to see if they can participate by giving an updated evacuation plan, which should be easy, disaster plan too, first responders. So I think um, some of us were assigned, I, they were going to assign me, but I think they should assign someone else to go and ask these generators for the evacuation plan to be given to first responders. Okay, and um, other information of whether it can be put in a ballot to help, um, to help, you know, the suggestion of getting the help majority of the, the um, well. Can you go back to the two yes. slides? Sure. Right here? Okay. We should create a referendum for an ordinance on the voting ballot. This is a suggestion. You could either um, create a special fund to help our emergency responders you know, because they do need help financially to, to be prepared, updated, you know, um, proactive in making sure that these facilities are running a tight ship. It is their corporate social responsibility for best practices, which every business is asked in good faith to participate in operating and doing. So one of the things that we had submitted to our county was to see if they could put together an, a special fund that could help our emergency responders for public health and also for public safety. And um, a referendum was something that I think if we 
if it, it was another option. Um, when we turn it over to uh, our facilitator, Barbara, we are going to go through these little um, suggestions for remedy. Um, and I did meet with Mayor Kim <coughs> on Friday uh, regarding some of the suggestions for remediation and for some of the ideas that we could come to help with their uh, issues. Is that good? So that's the presentation in a nutshell. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I thought I heard, Harry, that you had to leave at 11. Okay, so what we are planning on doing right now is just giving you folks the opportunity to ask questions and maybe provide answers to the PowerPoint presentation information that she just shared. Uh, right after that is when we would be uh, going over the action items that they had identified and maybe asking for your input on those action items, maybe identifying some of the stakeholders. So Harry, if you um, wanted to share any information regarding that as far as what the county might uh, be able to suggest or help with, then we can go ahead and take that information from you now before you leave. I think mostly not all of the things uh, I'll talk about briefly that was covered here can be more in detail with Bill, who is the expertise of these things. But I think one of the first things that I ran into in this uh, go around was an element of the location of a possible uh, composting site. I think it was a kill car and most of them here that led the charge for the coming to reconsider uh, the location of that uh, site. And as you know, it, it is a uh, village working on it, that they can give a further update on that, on uh, where the tentative sites are, what it can say without any uh, hesitation is that the site will not be the site identified originally. And we will identify that where you are, or you can see is uh, the, the Aside the test of finding the site. Regards to the landfill itself, I, my goodness, that's an embarrassing and old problem. <laughs> and I, I'll take the word embarrassingly and just leave it at that. You know, uh, it's more than that, obviously. Uh, you guys see the capacity of the landfill. And the reason when I first came, and this is how far back, embarrassingly, ago, it was 2000. And one of the first things was uh, brought to my attention was a letter from. Department of Health stating that you are at near capacity, you have approximately one year uh, to close it. Uh, working with the Department of Health you know, to expand, extend that time. Uh, the, the time was given and now we are near the end of that. Uh, we will close that landfill. Uh, we will, again, we'll give the details where we are on that. Uh, the uh, plan of that land that field now will be to transfer all of those things to the west side. Naturally, with all the other caveats of minimizing waste, uh, recycling the waste, and those things that Bill and others have been working on. Uh, those are the two main issues I think that we, are, as county government, are dealing with. The things that we should have brought to our attention. Uh, as I told her last time, office, I can tell the amount of work she put in on this just because of the words she used. Uh, and that this is not a matter of, you know, uh, educated people about it. So it's a matter of, you know, very few people come to the office and use terms like best available technique and, you know, those kind of things, or has the mitigation, et cetera. So that alone told me how much work she had to put into it. In regards to where we go on the landfill, it's going to take a lot of work to close it, a lot of expense to close it, but we'll follow and we'll govern by EPA rules and those will be done. Because the other things that was mentioned here is the release of the wastewater, the level two bill, and approximately, as uh, said Terry, approximately three quarter miles out of the Kimcock area. And I do know the concerns that you expressed to us in the meeting for the high level of contamination of 
a Hootie Bay area coastline. And I think Bill will also cover that. To the matter of fact, just yesterday he gave me an update on what he wants to do and will do with regards to identify you know, what's out there and where it's coming from. And again, almost, not most, all of the things I covered, Bill will be here to answer in detail what where he's at. I pay him a million dollars a year so he can take it. <laughs> That's an in-house joke I tell everybody. We all get paid a million, but I get, <laughs> I get two because I get the title. And I'm sorry I have to leave, but uh, I want to thank you, uh, you know, for all the work. I think I killed our people. I think they know. Uh, it was uh, you, know, you guys that the you know, organization that brought to the county's attention that the location of the couple's site was not right. As I talked to you and others, uh, and you know the history of disregard, disrespect, uh, putting the sewage plant right across the street from where people live, with the rationalization that uh, the H2S smell is three to seven or five. Uh, it may be a you know, that's just numbers, but you try sitting next to it, whether it be anywhere downwind, sit, try to live next to that and tell me, oh, it's only three to five or whatever the numbers give me. And all the apologies in the world are going to fix nothing except it's not there anymore. Uh, but I know residue smell like that. Right, we will do, I've got a good man in Bill, you know, uh, just gave him a full update just for the things they want to address. So thank you for your work. Okay, Harry. Uh, one of the things that's on the sheet of paper that we're going to be passing around probably right after you leave um, has a question of creating some kind of an asset fund. And one of the entities that she identified as possibly helping would be the county. So do you have any comments on or any thoughts about and, uh, creating some kind of an asset fund? And I think the asset fund idea, I think Jim will be speaking most of it came from the asset fund of the Geotone Adventure. And uh, by granting them the permit, a certain amount of money where it was given to the asset fund, the specific use uh, of how it can be used, and the control of them. And it's a good idea in regards to Puna, although you know, most of the people still tell you it's still inadequate for all that was done. To, to that area. In regards to the Kilkaha area, uh, I find it very difficult at this point to try to identify a source for that asset fund. I don't want to make the sound like an excuse, if it, does, uh, it is a difficult thing. It, it would be nice to have an asset fund in regards to various things that uh, the community would agree and participate how this fund would be used. I don't think there's any disagreement uh, in regards to how nice it would be to have an asset fund. Off the bat, you think, okay, all the oil companies or uh, companies should participate. Uh, not that you know, they do not, uh, because what they do mean that's the clean up funds and those kind of things, which they, you know, they do have a fund for that. I need to know specifically more uh, what the uh, idea is of the use of those funds, and then from there we can uh, brainstorm uh, credibility of it, and then we, we go as far as getting the funds. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, everybody. What a beautiful day. Huh? <laughs> Thank Thanks for coming to the introduction. Oh, sure. So, if you guys just want to introduce yourselves, so Pat and Steve. Thank you. Uh, Steve Bader, I work with the governor's office in Honolulu, but I'm from here. So. Thank you, guys. Okay, so anybody else have any questions or suggestions? Or I have concern? a couple quick, couple quick questions. I wanted, you know, um, after a hurricane or after like um, an emergency, you go back, like like earthquake. Then so many people would retrofit for earthquake. So, so next time the disaster happens, you're prepared. Is there any kind of retrofitting um, plans would be included in in what you propose? Is that part of it? So that's one question. And the other question is, when the administrative order was uh, put on Aloha Petroleum, 
and wondering, had you not been involved with this uh, effort, would that administrative order been imposed, or was it because of your efforts? Is it? When do you take it? It was probably because of my effort. You know, um, when start when I started to gather data, I gathered first from EPA. Um, because they were the, the they're the regulatory agency that keeps the thresholds for every generating company. They all have different toxins that they use in chemicals to operate their their facility. But they're also required annually to to submit a report to EPA for the emissions because they use several chemicals. Each chemical has to be recorded, and they also have to be reported. It, you know, with their reports, the amount that they have on site. And that's where the hazard evaluation, you know, emergency response, HAZMAT is involved. They are required by the Department of Health and EPA to identify what these chemicals are that they hold on site and that they receive to generate their emissions. So EPA has that all online. And so that was where I started first because they're the, they're the ones that set the standards for all of these um, um, facilities. So <coughs> I um, thank goodness to Department of Health that has been attending our meetings because the Department of Health Mr. Um, had let me know that there was a site that community can go into, punch their address to see if they're safe with these in industry um, facilities. So I punched in my address, my, my father's address, and poof, all of this information comes up. And you should try it if you live near one. It'll pop up. And it'll show you the facilities that are responsible for sending in this information. If they are a current violator, you will see that. And, and that's what they show on site. And however, some of the things that you, you, you have to understand is that they are only required to report annually their emissions. So if there was any excessive exposures that, um, that happened within a time span, you would not know unless until this information was given to the EPA. So I called EPA and I said, so who do I talk to regarding these issues? You are showing that these facility, facilities are non-compliant as we speak. Who do I speak to? to find out if you know who does the checks and balances. So they gave me to enforcement. And it took a while for enforcement to re return my call. And then enforcement did contact region. They have a system, regions, you know, for we we're region nine. And so people are responsible in Hawaii to facilitate <coughs> I mean, to checks and balance every generator there is in the entire state of Hawaii. Apparently, it was falling through the cracks. And so, if, had I not brought this to their attention, they would probably have gone on as they were for, for years. So, in 2014, enforcement came to Hilo. And that's when you have updated information like this presented to our community. Um, because they, Aloha Petroleum, sorry, wasn't the only one that got cited for excessive emissions. But you have to understand how long their emissions, you know, were, you know, were not, you know, excessive. When I say excessive, meaning past the standards, not within standards. These, uh, this is a problem. This is a huge problem for our families because these facilities, as you see, are in close proximity of each other. And whether they're emitting on land, in the ocean, um, in the air, it, these toxins are not race-based. Everybody participates in breathing and, you know, so, or swimming in it. So, when the fines were Im Im implemented on these facilities, I thought maybe some of the $650,000 would come back to the community that has had to bear this, this um, excessive exposure. And we found out no. You know, so what, when we met several times with the Department of Health, 
um, civil defense. A lot of times it's about funding and money. DOH cannot do their job properly, pro um, properly because they do not have enough funding for staffing their employees um, for them to do an adequate job. Probably the reason why, this is what I was told, probably, probably the reason why these facilities have gone unchecked for many years. So we came up with an idea for a strategy to try to see, well, if county you need help, let's go look for the money. Let's go look for some ways to come, you know, to find this. So when I presented this in August 1st, it wasn't about just saying, uh, talking about the SOAR. It was about looking for remediation for help in the areas that we identified there there's holes you know but because departments are so siloed like everybody talks about you're going to get people at different levels of time not communicating with each other and do i mean they're they're there every day doing their job and so when we meet with people that are responsible for monitoring they'll tell us they don't have the proper monitoring equipment they don't have enough manpower. And I'll give you an example. Wastewater, not wastewater, but water quality sampling is only done by one person on this entire island. And he is not stationed here in Hilo. He's stationed in Kona. So that was a problem for us because, you know, the data that I collected showed that there was inconsistency on the amount of times that this particular person monitors the shoreline, especially in Kilkaha and Puhi Bay. So my question after gathering this data, we came to our meeting, thank, you know, thank him for doing that, and the questions were asked, why are you not testing um, consistently in areas that we have concerns? Because I identified where people are getting sick with staff in MRSA, and they happen to be in areas close near the shoreline where majority of our children recreationally swim all year round. So these are some of the things that was identified. They are shorthanded. They don't have the money. The person that used to test on the east side, his, he res um, retired and, and DOH never thought about um, replacing someone. And then we found out from Aaron Ueno that the position is no longer available. So we found that as a problem. Then the consistency, I mean, and the reason why particular cases are not tested. And then there was a concern that this was county's jurisdiction, state's jurisdiction. So they both came to the table and in our community, and we videotaped this, and we found that county is responsible to test near the outfall, right, out in the outfall. DOH tests different places of the island. There's a disconnect for a lot of these um, data collection. And that's, if, if these people are supposed to be, uh, well, uh, these generators are supposed to be operating in safe practices, um, they're not. So that sums up what I'm talking about. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, there's an evacuation plan for tsunami where people go across the airport runway assuming someone can find the key, I hope they can, but suppose there's some uh, fuel leak or fire and people can't get out on a holding and they want to go through the airport. Is there a plan for that? County has an, uh, an evacuation plan and they use the tsunami plan for, for the Kilo Harbor area in Kilkaha. Um, it needs to be updated. It's yay, too thick, you know, books thick, um, because it does not, um, it does not discuss or, uh, explosions in case there's a disaster in the harbor area where all of the fuel tanks um, and storage tanks are. So it does not identify that um, on the current evacuation plan. They talk about explosions, but it is not regarding a disaster near the harbor. It talks about explosions with volcano. 
question. Anybody else? Uh, Terry, you've done one fantastic job. There were consultants that have paid millions of dollars to come through what you've done. It's fantastic. And I just want to echo what Terry said, because I'm a little nonprofit. We deal with the federal and state agencies. We are so disgusted and so disappointed, as Terry has been here. These people are getting paid to do a job, and they aren't doing it. And I'm glad you're here today because one place we want to go is to the governor's office. Because the and the Department of Health, the NLR, these agencies have a job to do, and Terry wouldn't be sitting here today, I wouldn't be sitting here today, if these agencies had done their jobs. And I'm, oh, not, I'm sorry, Bob. Okay. We're not pointing fingers today. No, I'm, Can I ask for a question? Okay, I, 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 but I'm just supporting Terry on what she <laughs> said. Okay? Thank enough, you. enough said, you heard me. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Monica? I, um, Thank you. I guess I, I just want to get clarification for the water monitoring um, at Kumi Bay. What I just heard is that the county is responsible for monitoring water quality near the sewage outfall. Is that correct? We're Mr. responsible Justin. for monitoring the outfall, which is three quarters or more out. Okay. We have to test that periodically. Shoreline is not within the purview of the county. And if, if I could make one point, Department of Environmental Management is an, essentially an operating company. We have no regulatory authority to speak of. I do now with styrofoam, <laughs> but that is the, essentially the only area where the department has regulatory authority. We are subject to Department of Health and EPA. And uh, I think most people believe that DEM is a regulator, but we are an operator. We're, we're, we're there, we're subject to regulatory oversight. So I would just put that out as a point. Okay, and, and then a follow-up question, the uh, position for the East Hawaii uh, DOH water quality monitor. Um, someone said that that position is no longer available. Is that still the status? Or yes. is there movement towards filling that position? Mm -hmm. No, it's no. Um, it's not available. Uh, we were told by Aaron Bueno that it's um, okay. um, it's no longer available. Uh -huh. A position anymore. So at one point they were saying it's now a federal position, but it's only for one year, and so no one wants it. Is that still correct? You know, I went to find out if that was. I went to apply. <laughs> they said it was. There was a, um, a federal position that was maybe just for a year, and I went to apply for it. So I called Aaron and the universe, um, the Department of Health, because I wanted to apply for it. And he confirmed that it's no longer available as a position. So it's not even there anymore. It's non existent. You know, I think that's something that Department of Health needs to answer. How the federally funded one year position mm -hmm. for environmental health mm -hmm. special, specialist got, was cut. Well, the position was cut. Right. Um, and this is where they said that they didn't have funding to to allow this to happen. So this is when I talked to OHA to see if they could put pressure on DOH, you know, as to have something like this available because one of the reasons for not having consistent testing in East Hawaii shoreline is because they're they're um, understaffed and they uh, he can't do it all you know, all the time. You know that's the reason why it's not consistent. Um, the sicknesses and illnesses are increasing. DOH only tests nationwide for enterococci and clostridium. Am I correct? Well, that's, that's my Am understanding. Those are the indicator biological elements that are normally tested. Right. So we would like to see other testing done. If if DOH sees and then you know as this as being a problem um, here in the in the state of Hawaii or Hawaii Island, because we've had a lot of people reporting sicknesses. 
after swimming the short line. I have one more follow-up question. Sorry. No, no. August 1st, I watched the presentation that Terry uh, presented to your committee. Uh, and so I really appreciated what Bill Tchaikovsky had to say about perhaps um, remedies in the future. So one of the things that was identified was polishing the water that's, um, that's discharged with um, supplemental treatment. Another um, remedy that was identified was using, instead of chloride or whatever um, chemical is presently used to treat the water, using UV, um, a more um, you know, environmentally appropriate or forward progressive um, remedy. What's, uh, what's the status of those two um, ideas that were presented on August 1st? UV and uh, polishing water. On uh, 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 both of those issues, it, it, it's a matter of, uh, and it always, as these things always do, it's a matter of funding and planning. If we plan to do it today, it probably wouldn't be done for four or five years once we go through the funding and the bidding and the installation. Uh, these are things that we are, we are looking at, uh, again, trying to balance what we, what we are mandated to do and what we would like to have the money to do. Those are two different areas. One, I have to have the money. The other is money that has to come from somewhere else and something else not get done. And that's really the, the, the balance that we have to make. But we are looking at UV particularly and in improving and upgrading the, the treatment in excess of what our permit requires is, uh, is being looked at as, as well. What I'm hearing over and over again is the lack of funding and then something that you brought up, Terry, a couple of times is that there are funds from fines, from violators being fined. What would have to change for that funding to come locally to fund some of these ideas? Is that a federal thing that would have to change? Yes. And and is there any way around that? Is there some sort of county resolution or state resolution that could be passed that would redistribute those funds? What, what would have to? Both county and state are saying right now that it is a, it's a standard that is implemented by the federal government. So it's a federal issue and from you, what I was told. Have you begun meeting with any of our other reps? That level, okay. not yet. Sure. Okay, I've um, gone to the county and now I'm going to the state. Yeah, so I know that's the next yeah. level, but I'm still. So, I'm just wondering yeah. if there's any. Um, so far, and and I think this is the dialogue in legislation. I, there was something that was really important that I wanted to bring. There was there was a uh, sample testing or survey that was put into the um, to in 2007 and 2013. And this was a policy making um, survey as to what are legislative officials in state level agencies um, and it lists all the uh, organizations that participated in the survey and it was about priority what our legislative body prioritizes public uh, public health is not considered a priority so what is public health you would talk about disasters, natural disasters, um, uh, health, uh, health clinics, you know. It is not the mindset of our policy makers. And you know, I have, I have the survey. You can take a look at it if you want it. So what we're presenting here to uh, legislation is key for CHI and for our state rep because it's a conversation that would probably be difficult, I think, uh, at the get-go if a large body of our policymakers are not prioritizing the health of our community. Then what, is, what, what do our policymakers prioritize if not health and safety? Well, in the pub, they, they categorize different areas, you know, infrastructure. For public, public health and safety, they prioritize drug abuse, the use of drugs, 
of obesity and um, clean um, access to clean groceries. That's the three, the trend, um, you know, since 2007, since the uh, United States recession, basically what they're looking at. So, you know, to have standards change, threshold statement change, additional testing asked by the Department of Health, it is going it, it is going to take efforts in the federal um, level legislators. Okay, Terry, I think um, Bob had a question, and okay, then sir. right after Bob's question, I'm going to move into the next um, part of the agenda, which will be to hand the, the sheets out. Terry, have you, have you approached uh, the FAA or the Air Force Division or anyone else on the airport property that's causing the impacts to your community and what cooperation have you got from these different levels of government to solve the problems that are causing these impacts? To be truthful, the first um, issue was the airport because it directly impacts my family. Um, and what, why I started the idea is because throughout the years, I've seen a very high cancer morbidity rate in our community, especially on our street. Um, of, uh, family members that might have passed away with cancer. Uh, my brother passed away very young at that age. So that was what triggered me to start doing investigations on does it have a relationship? Uh, was my brother's death related to the high toxic fumes that came from the airport? Um, you would only have to live in my home to, to know what I'm talking about. So. That started my research. And our community had discussed this issue with our, our community president. And I would like him to, to tell you, if you don't mind, Patrick, to explain a little bit about the, um, the initiative in 2000. Yeah. With, with the airport. Yeah. Uh, I, I, the, the question about the FAA being involved, uh, they began to become involved maybe in 2000, but it was after a question was being raised by uh, myself and others in the community that the state duty harbor, uh, airports suggested made a suggestion to the Department of Hawaiian Home, another state entity, that these vacant lands along the runway not be re-awarded. Uh, but somehow state entities forget that the Hawaiian Home Commission Act is not a state law. It's a federal provision. It was created by Congress in the 67th Congress, so therefore you Two state entities cannot sit around and discuss how we're going to award these lands. And it was because of its proximity to the airport that uh, they didn't want it. You know, in real estate, they call it a DROA, I think. You know, you need this, you gotta have these disclaimers and things that you gotta do before you buy the properties. So uh, that being said, uh, and the department reconsidered, uh, began to uh, re-award those lots that were vacant. It was now, be it became imperative that the federal government themselves started a noise abatement. How do, how do we restrict the, the, the noise that's uh, in close proximity? Uh, for, for us in Kioka, it's, it's just about the fact that who came first, the chicken or the egg? We just happened to be there before the airport was built. The, we didn't build around an airport, which is what na uh, nationally is what's happening. People build around an airport. We were hit. we were there. The airport came. So the the noise was the issue that Terry speaks about. It was about an issue that the noise abatement program is uh, really tied to funding, and the funding is from the federal government uh, with the federal administration now. Uh, they're not conducive to a state that's highly democratic, uh, controlled. 
Uh, and that's the politics of it. But if we understand that, then uh, you, you, I'm not saying we, we need to suffer, but we have to suffer if we choose to live there uh, and, and have these uh, interactions with government. So the FAA began with a, what I thought was a very ambitious plan. Hey, we're gonna, we're gonna retrofit those homes as you talk about. They wanted to retrofit. It's enough money to do 12, they ended up doing four. Came again, well, we got enough to do 14, and they ended up doing four more. So in, in the 10 year period, or 17 year period, they, they probably retrofitted 10 homes. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of us along the fence line. And with that came, you know, I, I had to begin to uh, educate myself in the community. They are what they call contour lines, where the noise of a plane, uh, the, the way it, the, the contour of the sound, so now, now that puts you in another category, whether or not you're in the 75 DNL, 65 DL, 55 tolerance. So if you hear, we're gonna do this. If, we, if you're there, we're gonna make your windows stronger, insulate the homes. Uh, and that began uh, that our discussion with the FA. So that, that has always been a discussion. It's, it's an active discussion uh, with the FA, but it began primarily on noise. Uh, and with that, we decided from the noise, there is uh, toxic because as far as we did with the airport, the sewer plant's been there about 50 years. So we went into the, the toxicity and we did have a report that was made uh, prior to Terry moving back into the community again and, and coming forward with the cumulative effect of it over the years. So uh, there is, you know, I, I still believe Kyoka is disproportionately uh, affected by it with due respect to everybody else. You know, PGV is one thing, but PGV got their, their funding that, that the mayors speak about was through revenue from PGV. You know, it wasn't necessarily a, uh, it became a community asset fund, but it had to become a community asset fund with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs because Office of Hawaiian Affairs also gets revenue off of those ceded lands. So that's, that's where the big discussion came there, monetarily wise. But for us, the Department of Hawaiian Home is been broke since 1920 and is broke now in 2018. So it is, it is, it, it is. I, I, I just need to share, uh, that's where we are in Kyoka in, in the, how we began. But it is going to be uh, an, an opportunity maybe, some of the things that's mentioning, that uh, and Terry's moved up to the next level and that's, it's gonna be to our two representatives that sit here I, I just hope that they can do that, uh, uh, but it's 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 an effort. It's a, it's going to be a Herculean effort to move forward, uh, and and be getting our and Terry is also doing another job that I believe is commendable, uh, and maybe none of you believe it really is, but you know you to get uh, our people to vote to get Hawaiian people to vote, to participate in the process that we're gonna have to we're take politically. Uh, that's, and the record shows it. Why? I, 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 I get my own reasons, but that's, that's, not, that's not the discussion here today. Thank but, you, Patrick. Yeah. Perfect segue. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Kamala's gonna hand up a sheet of paper. All of the um, identified action items and entities that could be responsible or helpful in those items. And so uh, once you get your sheet, you can just kind of look at them ever so briefly. Um, take a few minutes to, to think about stuff. We have pens on the table there if you want to write anything. <laughs> 
um, attached to any of the items there. Terry's actually going to walk you through the list um, in a minute. So anything that pops out to you folks, please go ahead and let me know. I will try and capture as much as I can. Thank goodness um, it's being recorded today. So this is where they can um, ask the questions as I go through. I know we have a, yep. a, a either now or after. Or after. Okay. Yep. All right. I'm going to move through this really quick. And um, Kai, if you have any questions after I go through this, um, please do, do. I know that we have a short period of time left. Um, Okay, legislative um, representative for the state level. Um, disclosure of reports. This is something that we have found a lack of. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, there, Patrick explained how long ago they worked on the noise abatement project. Monitors were put in, the, in our community to check and balance the sound. Um, and in our meetings, we were we found that these reports were never given to our community. So it and it, it it's still something that we're going to be requesting as a monitor reading so that we can at least have some data um, on the report of these um, readings. Disclosure of reports on the idea that. You know, in a meeting, a lot of our members did not know that there was a clear zone um, attached to our community. And what is a clear zone is a crash zone. Um, contour lines for mitigation for the noise, but there's also a clear zone that's within our community that a lot of our community members did not know existed. It's a crash zone. And we have a lot of our families that have been there forever that are, that are actually in the clear zone. Um, that's an example. Cumulative health study, we were, we were working on the idea of getting this cumulative health study. And so I know, you know, the first time I brought this up, it was, Terry, that's huge. And I said, yes, I do know that it's huge. But we're right now, after all of this data collection, having um, universities that are actually looking at participating in thinking about doing a cumulative health study and how they're going to shape this, they would come up with the idea. Asset fund, we went over the asset fund with uh, Mayor Kim. This was a, an example of how a special funds could be put together. I, you know, about the geothermal asset fund. The geothermal, um, the GRI legislative bill that was proposed by the state years ago is what shaped geothermal uh, participation for a fund statewide. And, and then there's another fund that is partic um, it's, uh, participatory, or they voluntary. They volunteer for this fund. And, and it's usually done at the time of permitting, which is um, something that you can propose during the permitting process. So what we're asking facilities to participate in shaped like an asset fund is asking them to do something that um, should have been done at the, the permitting stage, which some facilities uh, have said they're grandfathered in. You know, what that definition means, I'm not even sure, because that's not clear. But um, a lot of these facilities were put in place before, in 1978, before the environmental impact statements and processing was even um, in place. So, our suggestion for, for something that could be done uh, for an asset fund for facilities that, have already, that already exist could be when they have to reapply for a permit. Okay, so, go ahead. <laughs> So the state hasn't, we have a Hawaii Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act that creates local emergency preparedness committees. And Representative Todd and myself were part of the 2017 legislature that passed Senate Bill 976 that increased tier two filing fees from $100 to $200. So back in 2014, about, I don't know, 880 or so facilities 
deposited about $69,000 into this fund, you could in, es in essence double that amount, right? Because you've now increased it to $200 for this tier two fee. And those funds get held by the Environmental Response Revolving Fund and then get distributed to the different counties to provide for some of the things you're talking about. So how does that fund and those funding mechanisms differ from what you're proposing? Because I don't want to grow another layer of government. I want to use what we existing have now. It's difficult to get anything passed at the legislature. So how are we not using this effectively? How, are we, how does the county of Hawaii uh, request funding from that revolving fund to provide for its annual emergency preparedness, uh, equipment needs to purchase, I don't know, different things. Yeah. I, I believe. Um, I can sorry, probably uh, speak to that. I'm on the LAPC community. And you are as well. And so, so is Terry. Uh, so that money does go for the kind of things that Terry is suggesting that we need more equipment for emergency responders and training. So we use that money each year. Hawaii County only gets a little piece of that determined, uh, depending on how many uh, facilities report. Um, you know how so much? We've been getting about 15,000 a year, something on that order, so that'll double to, say, 30, I, I'm estimating here. So it's not a whole lot of money, but it, it does accumulate over years. It's based on the amount of facilities on the island? It is. It okay. is. So each one is required to, in their Tier 2 reporting, pay a fee of 200. Right. So there, but there are ways of working on uh, getting more money. People think there's vast underreporting, so we can work on getting more uh, companies that should be reporting reporting and increasing those funds. That's one way. The other thing is under the LEPC, that on a statewide level, that meets monthly. They have uh, also grants that they work on, something called the HMAP grant yeah. that we can apply for and get additional grant funding under the big umbrella to work on a project here that could, could apply to the harbor or somewhere else. Uh, our committee is, uh, you know, all everybody has full-time jobs, so not a whole lot of people work on working up a whole other grant proposal to submit, even though it's a good chance we could get those monies if we had some resources to put into grant writing to submit to that. So those are two areas where we could increase activity locally on the LEPC to get uh, more people signed up so we get uh, more monies as well as tap into these grant funds that are available if we have the resources to apply. So that's definitely what we should do, right? To represent part of myself, we can find out how much money is existing in the current development fund. And then uh, as a community or the LEPC working with other community organizations, we should make sure that all facilities, if they're not um, being included in this uh, count, that they're paying their fair share, or even if they're not paying, we should make sure that um, we have a good inventory on this island. I mean, that's a way to increase funding and increase their Hawaii County's proportionate mm -hmm. share. And how, then, uh, so. How, how do we identify those companies or facilities that aren't, that are under reporting or that aren't reporting? You know what, uh, I'm sorry, John, go ahead. So John and I have been working on how this idea of the asset fund, you know, and participation. How are we going to identify, going to identify what facilities participate in this? So with the data that I have, um, you know, in it's it's kind of like that map I showed you. So these facilities that I've identified within the proximity of this particular community is how we're identifying this. So it's, it's, this ground truthing was the cumulative risk assessment, meaning I'm finding out the risk that these facilities have upon this particular community, which, you know, where we were looking for our community. So what we did was we identified these particular facilities within this particular community and, and put a little circle around those. And so one of the things that John and I thought, well, how are we gonna, wrap in DOT or the harbor. And um, one of the things that we identified with risk is the fact that the um, common denominator for all of these facilities is the, the need for chemicals that are being shipped into the harbor. And majority of these chemicals and uh, oil are 
toxic um, chemicals that are reported to to has uh, to here um, and hazmat are within close proximity of the harbor. So that's how we identified who would be. We thought about doing all tier twos, but that you know. So we identified there was like 100 and um, maybe 160. Uh, approximate 160 tier two companies that are on the island alone, on Hawaii Island. So we're thinking um, if they were to all participate in this one. Now the idea of this increasing on the the uh, state emergency planning committee came from you know, I think, I, I think so in our community committee to ask that they increase the fees for our first responders, um, but. In conversation with our first responders, they are in, in regarding the disasters that would be happening in this particular spot is why the conversation for these facilities to participate because they would have the the largest risk to the group of people. So identifying that we are carrying the larger burden of these generators in our community is apparent just by what you're looking at. So the need for us to protect the people that are in Waiakea, Keopaha, and Pamaeva was priority. So how are you gonna decipher what facilities was by the risk that this particular city, Hilo, has to bear to bear? That's what we're sh sharing today. Does that answer you? But then, you know, go ahead. Just, I, I think what Shannon was asking is how, you have identified all the under-reporting companies in your, in our community, in your data collection process and the risk assessment. And so my question is, is it really just a dollar amount for a permit or is it based on the amount of risk that particular company represents in the community? I mean, in terms of what we charge. Because if it was risk-based, it, it might um, increase the fund more rapidly. Just throw that out. And if it is, if it is risk-based, and and there may be underreporting. Uh, let's see. I'm 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 simple in this. If there's 160 identified tier two businesses. Each should pay two hundred dollars. That's that's your that's the amount of money. Okay. So, is that what's happening now? How how do where do we go? Who does it? That collects the two hundred dollars. How do you know that the person has not reported? What's the what's the ramifications for not doing it? Uh, if I don't pay my income tax, somebody comes after me. So if somebody don't pay the two hundred dollars, how 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 would Representative uh, Kahele and or Todd, uh, excuse me, Senator Kahele and, and or Todd know that this is happening? Who does it? What so it? That's done by the hero office. Uh, the, so they collect the monies every mm -hmm. year. Uh, there's substantial penalties for people who don't report, but okay. there's not a not a great way of finding out who's not reporting other than looking at the kind of company that they're reporting and then going through the, like the phone book. So there's no, else. yeah, but there's no, there's no, you, there's no need to register that I have, that I, this, my company does, uh, in fact, cause uh, or have work with this, that, and th those. Well, there's information given to companies about who's required to report and what those thresholds are. So it's risk based in that they have to meet a certain threshold, they have to have a certain quantity of those materials. But above that, everybody just pays, right? Pays the same. Uh, so it's not tiered in terms of people that have great quantities or, or whatever. But if they get over a certain quantity, they pay. And um, I think what's, uh, you know, there's just not a whole lot of ferreting out those companies that aren't paying. There's a, a fine system in place to say if you don't, you'll get penalized. So to the extent that that's there, like a traffic penalty, hopefully the others hear about that and they report. That's the kind of situation that's out there, to my knowledge. But I was thinking, as far as directing any monies uh, that would benefit the Keokaha communities in particular, 
or the ones by the uh, Y High Harbor in that area might be the HMAT piece of this LEPC that I mentioned. Uh, for example, the LEPC has talked in the past about doing a hazard materials inventories that's flowing through the harbors. We don't know. I mean, the ships that come in have a manifest that have to report what's on there and what it is, so they can be tracked if we have access to the manifest, but no one's done that. So we don't really know exactly uh, the amount and what toxic chemicals are coming through and where they're flowing, right? Everything has to come in through the harbor or the airport. You're right there, and it goes out from there. And if, the comp if certain companies have a certain quantity, they have to report tier two, but all the materials come through there. What's traveling through, what's getting transported, loading on trucks every day, what hazard does that represent to the community if that blows up or gets stolen or a uh, uh, fire starts, you know, that work could be done, and the HMAP uh, grant could be a, an avenue to do that. In fact, the LAPC has talked about that as a project in the past, but like I say, uh, no one has ha had the resources to work on that in addition to their full-time jobs and coming to the meetings to, to work on a project like that. Yeah, for, for, for your organization, but is, isn't there, I, and, and again, this just being this only because if we're talking about the harvest, wouldn't you be, or I shouldn't even say you, wouldn't would be a state entity that can should be able to track that? I mean, Homeland Security is, is something else. If you got a report through Homeland Security, I can't even get it into the gate without a tweet card. So I'm saying, what, what I'm hearing is that maybe, because we don't have that information, maybe they, they, they're just uh, a way that those reportings got to go not necessarily to you, but maybe to the senator and a representative uh, in his position. I, I, think look at. I think you're right. As far as I know, those things have to be reported on yeah. the manifest. In the the man, it, I mean, it is got to be. It's a matter of who's looking at that and who, That's right. who needs to look at it. Or get yeah, and, 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 and maybe, and maybe, maybe, it, yeah, maybe they can do that. And, uh, you know, but again, because the whole thing is running through is money and resources everybody everybody there's no money no resource to do that and and i i agree with senator Kahede that you know you, you, you do not create uh, another beast to eat the beast thank you patrick and another thing we're really short of is time so terry if you can continue yes. to um move through the list in, i have to leave in like three minutes i have another meeting so okay. let me just Go ahead. so i can just yeah. a few things so i'm still a little bit unclear of what we at the state level need to take away from this meeting. I mean, fantastic information, great presentation. I get it, but there are certain things that maybe either represent Todd or you can provide specific things that you'd like us to do at the state level, working with the Department of Health, to do things that are within our control, right? We can't, we can write letters to our congressional delegation, but we can't, uh, you know, the federal EPA standards is something that is out of our control, you know? So, from what I'm gathering from here, um, the uh, offices should have a current evacuation plan, hazard plan, community assurance. The county should at least contact these facilities to get an update. I'm not sure what the counties have done on that. We don't have a voter referendum ballot initiative in the state of Hawaii, so if you want to pass something, it has to go through the legislature. The asset fund for health and safety of Kyokai residents, we can look at that and see maybe we can look at possibly tweaking the law to see how we can identify communities that are most um, vulnerable to these toxic facilities like Kauai High or Keokaha or other communities throughout the state that are co-located with um, probably no community is like Keokaha. That is on almost every single uh, every, every entity. entity you can imagine <laughs> is within the one mile geographical radius of the Keokaha homestead community. So carving out that in, in the law, it might allow additional funding to maybe go to a LAPC subcommittee in Keokaha. I don't know if you've looked at that as a county to see if maybe there should be these identified communities that have subcommittees at the county level that, you know, you, you could um, help steer the Keokaha side and then through legislation we can steer more of our uh, fair share of those what funds resources that you for community need. resources you need. So that's how I would address that one. Um, but we need more information on specific Department of Health 
things that we could help with, such as additional water testing or, like Bill said, mm -hmm. what are we mandated to do, to do versus uh, in excess of what our current permit requires, like, like UV testing and things like that. Um, that's Bill. what I'd take away from this, but I gotta go make another uh, meeting, so. Bill, thank you for that, Kai. I wanted to yeah. answer that. I, I would just say one thing. One thing the legislature could do is provide support for adequate funding for DOH. They need money to bring the people in. They don't have it. I know budget's tight everywhere, but if there's a single thing, probably that would make the most difference is getting adequate funding to DOH. And as someone who regulates me, it's difficult for me to say <laughs> that. But that is, I think that for me is the number one the most important and easiest, well, all things considered, the easiest thing to do uh, to, to help the situation. So I would dial that down even more because every, all 18 state departments ask us for more money, right? Exactly. Gila R needs more money. Dole Care needs more enforcement on this island, you know? Right. So if we need more money for DOH, specifically for what? Like, yeah. where, enforcement. what are the limitations at the county level that the DOH is not providing that are putting us in this situation so we can advocate for more funding specifically. What is the position that we talked about that's been eliminated in East Hawaii for water testing? That's one where DOH needs the money to replace that position. I know you can't create the position, but we have the governor's office represented. And also, um, we currently have a sanitarian as head of our Department of Health here on the Big Island. We need a medical position in that position when this gentleman retires. We have too many uh, diseases uh, threatening us between staff and rat lungworm disease. I mean, I could rattle off the list. We need a medical position as is the head of the other county DOH branches. So those are some things that I would appreciate if you guys could work on uh, specifically and also um, this, this issue with the manifests and where is this information going? Find that out because this is very disturbing. Should we have a hurricane, should we have a natural disaster, it would put us in a very terrible position if we don't have information on the chemicals that are on the ground. I think we've already seen this happen in the Texas hurricane with the uh, plant that uh, was exploding and the fumes were um, damaging to the public and to the first responders. So those are some things that I would like to sort out that I think you at the state could help us with um, in particular. If you can uh, elaborate more on the medical position, I think that could help. As far as the water testing position, we can find out whether the line item position was eliminated or not funded or it was the DOH exactly. who decided not to fund it. Because exactly. the legislature does have yeah. the perfect and just think of the comes down the foot. When I, when I agreed to have it here, I, I was a kind of frightened to talk to the mothership and let them know that I wasn't going to have this meeting. I actually had another responsibility um, in my mail, so I was free. They could have a conference room. But I, what I'm seeing is, I, I, I don't see why Terry has to do it. She did five years of work. Why can't the state and the county talk? I think, you know, I mean, well, thank it, you. It, it seems like there's a lot of <laughs> solutions. The LAPC, that. That's actually where I was going with this. We have very few minutes and I know that Kai has to leave so that's what I wanted to say to you was that today was just the first meeting for her at this stage. Um, she's going to be taking the information from this, going through it and then making contacts back with all of you folks again. You've identified some action steps or some more information that you and um, Chris can maybe look at. And so things like that, that maybe people suggested today, any, any um, identification of, of action steps or anything like that, she's going to compile a kind of a report from today's meeting and put that back out to you folks again. Right. So she will clarify some of the asks that she's asking for, and hopefully she can refine that from the information that's being shared today. Okay, so if I could just ask one, one more thing. As far as funding, specific funding, because you said, you know, all agencies are requesting, one of the things I heard was the, um, there's been identified 162 uh, TRIs that could be reporting that could increase the funds. So if there was money for enforcement for DOH, 
to enforce that, um, to ensure that all TRIs are properly reporting and therefore properly uh, depositing money into the fund, which eventually comes to the counties, right? Just because that was something I understood. Just, just, so just, that would yeah. be just as a quick comment on that. The Sorry, I got to go. Not this is my partner in crime right here. <laughs> so, so uh, Chris will handle the rest and uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, yeah. Did you get it? Did you get get the information? Craig is already working on uh, a legislation for the head of the DOH. Okay. okay. So go ahead, Craig. Oh, um, well, just in regards, if you're providing more money in for enforcement, I think there's probably a 99% chance that you actually appropriate more money to enforcement than you would end up collecting is the issue. Because it's only a, even after the increase for the filing fee, it's only $200. So, I mean, that's like a day's salary, you know, for a, for a reasonable uh, state employee um, at that rate. So the odds that you're catching one person or one business every day to even fund a position, it's very, very unlikely. Um, so, I mean, that's the thing. We're only talking about, you know, even after we pass the legislation, it's only $200. So if, let's say that 20% of these businesses aren't reporting, you know, you're only talking about an additional, you know, $6,000 a year, and that's for the entire Big Island. I think the other, so for the asset fund, I guess, like, do, do you see, do you envision it more in the way that we're already Utilizing these. Well, I was hoping I could, you know, tell Pi before he left. Sure. And he can watch the video if he wants to. <clears throat> what is important to know is that what's in place right now is not working right. at all. Mm -hmm. So, convenient monitoring, enforcement, thresholds not being met, and standards mm -hmm. is not working and it hasn't been working for our community for decades. So what we're asking for is for help with funding that is not in place at all already. Like Kai mentioned, there is, everybody's asking for money. So we're not here asking to go and borrow money for what's already available. What we're asking is a listening ear as to how we as community can come up with suggestions mm -hmm. to fund these people. I mean, I mean, these areas of need. So the suggestions we put in the wall, it's just an idea that we're coming up as a community with agencies coming together to remedy the issue. It sounds like you're not willing to go and take some of these suggestions. And this is something I want to kind of hear. It sounds like you don't want to reinvent the wheel, so you want to stay status quo. Am I correct? Yeah, you said you're the biggest partner in crime. <laughs> <laughs> I would have rather have to ask Kai. But since you're here, oh, I mean, it sounds uh, like you're not going to be writing. Or no, well, we, 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 we talked a couple weeks ago, and I think I think the cumulative health study for that entire area. I think that's that's kind of an easier ask, and I think that that's necessary because I think part of what we're talking about is when we're dealing with state agencies, we need concrete data. Not, not just, you know, hey, we have these, you know, violators in our area, but as far as the actual, like, cumulative health impact for an area. And I think that's that's necessary. Um, I think funding the position, that's that's also reasonable, obviously, for the water testing. And I think that that's achievable. Like, in terms of increasing the DOH budget in general, I think that's difficult. Um, specifically, I mean, for the same reason, there's a budget issue and every department is asking for more than they're getting. I think it's so a difference that should be made, though, because for right. water quality and health, public health and safety, this is a statewide issue. Mm -hmm. By solving this, we could solve the future potential. I understand. I mean, but I guess, like, the, I mean, unless you're actually generating more revenue, where is that money? It has to come from a different department. And that's, there isn't, I don't think I can point to a state department that's overfunded. So. But the county's in the same, the same right. situation. Right, no, no, I, I understand. We understand, we got yeah. we have everything we want to do and enough money to do only some of what we want to do. Right. And <coughs> but, just, yeah, so I think the water the water testing position, I think it's reasonable. And, and if Rep. Cregan's, you know, on that specifically, is at work? 
Um, not for the water testing position, but for the head of DOH for the Ireland and advocating mm -hmm. for a okay. medical uh, professional for that yeah. position. So I think I think what we can what we can realistically do on our end is we can look into the water testing position, and by that it's yeah, it's did that come from DOH itself? Because it's difficult to force a position onto a department. Mm -hmm. I'm just just thinking honestly on that. It, we we generally don't have that kind of authority. Um, but if it's something that it was just a budgetary issue that can be reinserted, um, I mean we can definitely work with you know Sylvia Loom. She's very reasonable on this kind of stuff. And uh, next time she's on the island, it might be a good idea um, for us to try and set something up too, so she has kind of half of a handle on um, that. And you know Rep Nakashima actually this week. He's now the new vice speaker of the house. Mm -hmm. So that's another person where he's definitely in a better position on the New York High um, because he's you know, officially either the number two or three in the house right now. Um, I didn't have a question. No, I was just going to emphasize when you spoke about increasing the permit fee from 100 to $200, um, and if there was a way to tack on um, and amend that um, part of the uh, State law to make it a tiered. A I, I think it should. Be. It and should be tiered and like I, in, in yeah. terms of risk assessment. Yeah. Yeah, because you're you're treating you know some of these place, some of these places that are these tier two facilities these are small businesses, yeah. and they're paying the same amount as if they're a major producer. Right, right. So, so. I, I think that's also achievable. I think we can definitely draft legislation to have. We have to find out, you know, what the specific criteria is. We have to research it, but I think that's also reasonable. And it's a way to, I mean, someone should be paying two hundred dollars. Maybe someone else should be paying twenty thousand dollars, right? So that's a way to dramatically increase the fund. Not saying that it's it possible to get it done immediately, but I think we do need to put that in works, and that's reasonable. It doesn't make sense. And that, otherwise. that should generate the money that you guys need for mitigation, not to create more positions within sure. state government. So yeah. and that needs to be clear. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the um, things that was important for state legislation was a need for putting pressure on the Department of Health mm -hmm. for several reasons, you know, monitoring. If they are required, well, what I'm saying, not all facil uh, facilities, they, they tell us that they are regulated by DOH and EPA, so they are required to monitor on their own their testing. Mm -hmm. Disclosure of these reports should be given real time available for our present DOH um, department. So what we're saying is everything's centralized on Oahu. Right. So by the time we get this information, it's gone already. Mm -hmm. The emissions, the pollution, the excessive exposure to our community has already been done. So what we're talking about is cumulative impacts, meaning our our families have been having to endure these excess, excessive exposures. Mm -hmm. So how is it actually being checked and balanced? Checked and balanced, and the regulators are Department of Health. How can they do an adequate job to do their job so that we don't have to go create our own private testing like we are now mm -hmm. for water quality? We're actually doing you know that now because it's important to our community that we know what's in the water now, right. so that people are safe to swim, which is their job. Mm -hmm. which is the Department of Health's job. So if they're telling us that they're underfunded and they're telling us that they don't have the right equipment to test mm -hmm. particulates, to test the water, they don't have a position opening, we're already actually telling you exactly what's needed. So we can start with that. Mm -hmm. And we have another resource here in Hilo um, at the university. Right. And um, Dr. Tracy Wagner, who gave the presentation in my committee last week on um, staff, Mm -hmm. um, they can be funded to do these studies. Mm -hmm. So again, it comes down to, unfortunately, a matter of money. But mm -hmm. we have the, the physical resources here to do some of these studies. So um, it's... Thank you for that. Yeah, I think Bob has one more question or remark or something, and then I'm going to ask Terry to wrap up the... Okay. Just go ahead with your closing remarks. Bob, just quickly, who is responsible for this list? Who is responsible for that list? K-A-N is responsible. K-A-N. Terry, Terry, may I suggest um, some additions? Uh, I think the pets need to be in here, and the FAA, both the ACT and the FISCO, need, need to be added to this list. Okay? Because mm -hmm. that's the year for Patrick. That's the big impact. I think the State Air Force Division 
and I'm sorry, Kyle, up, but a state Air Force division needs to be added to this list because that's part of the impact that's taking place. I think DOH noise division needs to be added to this list. And I want to echo what Terry said, if Barbara doesn't cut me off. <laughs> but what Terry has said here today, and what she just said about p responsibility of agencies to do these jobs that we nonprofits, even though Eileen tells me nonprofits need to do it, or other uh, ones that do it, <laughs> nonprofits are not responsible for this. This is state agency responsibility, federal responsibility. And I support Terry completely on this, and thank you for not cutting me off, Barbara, but I would suggest we add these to this list, and we work together on this to make this work. Thank you, and so that's, um, if anyone else has any other stakeholders that they could just identify real quick, just like Bob just did, excellent job. Oh, we were gonna ask for that, so if there's anyone here, or uh, anyone not here that you think should be here, or maybe should be at the follow-up meeting, anyone, anything, the President Trump's busy, so here is it, no. I, the only thing I would really like to see added to this list is the actual, um, facility, like private companies. Um, I, I feel like there's still some way, and we talked about this briefly um, in a previous meeting, but to get buy-in from the facilities, the polluters, to be better neighbors, to whether it's some offering some sort of tax incentive to those facilities. I mean, I know there's already some different things in play, and I understand the, the tier two, that they would be upping their fee, maybe based on risk, but to maybe have them want to be on this list and want to come to the table and figure out a way to take care of their communities because a lot of them are employing people who live in those communities so to have to take care of their workers and take care of the people that live around them and that they're servicing um, so I would like to see them included too thank you for that Thanks. Steve do you have any words of wisdom or anything from the governor well I just want to you know, thank Terry. Um, I'm thankful for the work she does. I'm proud of Terry for everything she's been doing on behalf of the community. And um, also for being invited, even though it was sort of a last minute invite that had to run from another meeting, but I, I appreciate the opportunity because it's, you know, I'm, I grew up here and I, I'm always um, supportive of things that's gonna make, uh, you know, the community better. And I know the governor is concerned all the time about health and safety. And so it's a matter of, of tying the ends, right? It's always like that, that people got to tie and connect things together. So even on the governor's end, uh, making sure that there's communications and uh, understanding what's going on in the community so that when they deal with their departments, uh, there's uh, conversations that we're all tied into. And so that's, you know, I learned a lot today and there's some things I can talk to uh, Chris and Kai about, and of course the governor's staff, the governor has, uh, research and policy development staff that's assigned to agencies that can kind of be helpful in getting information or, or um, you know, moving initiatives forward too. So, uh, you know, I think we just gotta keep at it. Just keep at it, Terry, just keep going for it, you know? Thank You're doing great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, helpful figure out what's coming into the harbors and the airports kind of preventing an emergency before it happens. Do they do any of that? Well, I brought up that issue because the LAPC has talked about that before. We assumed in our short discussion that we've had about this in the past, we assume that that information is available through shipping manifests and existing right. reporting systems. It's just a matter, can we get access to that information, look at it and make sense of it? And, and part of that would be finding out, well, what is coming through, what and how much, and and then that would lead you to an analysis of that data and say, you know, should we be advocating alternate things happening out there? Yeah, so, you're saying uh, no one has the time to do it. Yeah. So FEMA put some funding into maybe a temporary person or a part-time person to, to go and actually do that on the ground work? I don't know. Like I say, in the past, the LAPC has talked about the HMET grant as a possible avenue uh, to explore to, to do that kind of work. But uh, that has, again, uh, it's just a resource issue on the LAPC, finding someone with enough time to put a grant proposal together. <laughs>
to uh, submit and see if we can uh, get that money through the HMAP grant. Does FEMA ever do anything with prevention, or are they only come in after? I don't know if FEMA, they, uh, I don't know FEMA and their, the federal emergency management, I don't know their grant, their another programs and that sort of thing. Another one we need to look into. That could be yeah, a stakeholder. Yeah, could be looked into. Yeah. That could be a stakeholder. Yes. I believe that requires the disaster declaration before they can get involved. Before they can get involved. They wait until after it pulls up. <laughs> not reactionary. It's emergency management, not emergency. Yes, Hawaiian Health. Uh, one other funding possibility that Terry and I have talked about in the past, and that, that was focused on when we found out about this big Aloha Petroleum uh, uh, penalty that they got. They had an overfill, mm -hmm. 30, 15,000 gallons, I think, of diesel came out of the top of one of those tanks. Went down, soaked in immediately because we have fractured rock here in the harbor. Right and it went right down. So that resulted in a large penalty, 650000 When I talked to the, uh, that's all under the jur jurisdiction of EPA out of the San Francisco office. When I talked to their staff and asked them about the, those fines, the actual occurrence happened five years before the actual legal uh, decision. <laughs> that's how long it took for that to come down. So we didn't, we didn't know about it. It was all happening on the federal level and when it came out. But once we did find out five years later about the result, you know, I asked them, well, what if, uh, you know, in, in these kind of settlements, is there a leeway for the monies to go to the communities if they, if they have a, a way of funneling that money to uh, that kind of work? And they, and they said they had heard about that before. If there was something set up and they knew about it, it would have to be part of the negotiation with the judge and all that. But that is a possibility. So if we could set up a mechanism like that and work with EPAs so the next time something like that comes along, we might have this opportunistic thing. Hopefully we don't have a big a, a spill like that again. But if it does come up and we have something set up, that could be an opportunity to, to uh, funnel some of that, that penalty money into uh, a community use. Uh, now that was just hearsay through a conversation to them, but they said they had heard that had been done in the past. So that's a federal kind of thing we could, we could potentially work on. Yeah, we're a little challenged there because of our lack of direct um, representation from District 9 in the state. Um, and we don't find out about them until after the fact, you know, find out about these types of things. And they assign different people for different um, issues. So you don't get the same person, you know, for the different issues that are, um, that are a concern when the, the time comes. So the oil companies do have, um, you can go as a community to go and apply, you know, for it. The, the fees get sent to the executive branch the president makes a decision as to how this is used nationwide. It goes to a special fund for community. If you knew about it, <laughs> you can apply uh, for grants to help you with the impacts that this particular spill or hazard or disaster can happen. But majority, it's not publicized. You, know, you have to go and do your research. So we found out what that is thanks you know, to the Department of Health here. My question, where do these fees go? We found out that it does not come back to the community. So what we're, what we're, the bottom line for today is we know that these infractions and these cumulative impacts have been exposed, you know, to our community. So what we're asking these uh, facilities and generators to do is to take responsibility for what has happened and to prevent it from continuing to happen by reducing the risk that has already been identified to this particular group of people. So we are actually, like he said, like Kahele said, we are the only community that has had to endure this kind of impact in the entire state of Hawaii. So to us, it should be priority. Yeah. You know, I mean, on a scale from in statewide, Kyokaha, Hanaeva, and Waiakea has had to bear the burden at least the most in the state of Hawaii. So if 
if there was anything brought to this table, to this state level, it's just the beginning. The dialogue that we have today is the reason why we ask it. Because this has never been brought to your table, obviously, in the legislative policy making body. And, and to find out that a survey was done, that public safety and health <coughs> is not priority in our policy makers. I mean, I have this, you can go online and check it out. It was a survey after the recession, and it is not priority for our, uh, our policy makers. So if it is not, then this is history we made. To be able to have this dialogue be brought from a community that has been identified carrying this kind of burden in the entire state, not even along carries a burden that our people here have had to bear for decades. So these infractions in 2014, if this is the first time that these facilities have ever had an administrative order, can you just imagine the decades that these people have had to endure excessive exposure? And so I appreciate everybody that has come to this table today because this is the first dialogue that is being brought to our state legislation. Kai and um, our state rep, Chris, is not the first that's going to hear from you. This is going to be presented to every legislature so that they can feel that this is a priority. Number one, if we are the only ones having to bear this in the entire state, then they should take it as a priority. Because, Kyokaha Pana Eva are the peers of Hawaiians the only ones left that should be considered like an endangered species. They have environmental protection for endangered species. They're on a federal list of protection. And the only group of pure Hawaiians at this amount in population happens to be in my community. I'm doing everything I can to protect an endangered species because they are my family. They are my blood. They are my uncles, they are my aunties, they are my parents. They are my brothers and sisters. And I will do whatever it takes so that the state can prioritize this group of people as an endangered species. And it's all worth it. Even if I have to rewrite if I have to implement policy that no legislature sees the need for. Reinventing the wheel? I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm creating policy that has never been in place that is needed. And if you can help me, by all means, that's what you're here for today. Thank you for that, Terry. Mahalo, we go. Yes, thank you so much for all the work that you do. I just want to remind everyone here that hopefully you signed in the sign-in sheets with your contact information. Like I said earlier before Kai left, Carrie's going to be synthesizing these notes from today. She will pass them on to you folks. I'm hoping that you'll take these sheets with you and maybe look at them some more. If you can come up with any suggestions for other stakeholders that should be um, invited to the next meeting, then that would be awesome. We, she will also be suggesting dates for the uh, next meeting. Okay. Thank you, everyone. You guys are the bomb. Thank All right. Thank you. Thank you. I love you guys so much. You are. You're greatly appreciated. Your your presence, your body. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thanks, Bill.